Hello, and thank you for joining our webinar today. Uh, the topic is supermassive intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, and um, I'm pleased to introduce our speakers. Uh, we have Ethan Ludmer, who's a, an assistant professor at MD Anderson Cancer Center. Uh, he's jointly appointed it in the departments of gastroenterology, uh, gastrointestinal radiation oncology and biostatistics. Uh, in addition, he's active in clinical research pursuits, specifically for biliary tract cancers. And he leads a group focused on optimizing clinical trial design and execution. And uh, he will be your presenter today. And your moderator today is Dr. Juan Ballet. He's a professor in medical oncology at the University of Manchester and the Christie in the UK. One of his major achievements um, includes international recognition for the clinical research in the field of biliary tract cancers, particularly through establishing the re reference treatment for patients with advanced disease. It's also known as the ABCO2 study, and it's published in the was published in the pre prestigious New England Journal of Medicine. He's also been involved in developing other standards of care, including adjuvant chemotherapy with BILCAP and second line treatment with ABC of six. So, um, Ethan. Thank you very much, Donna, for the uh, introduction. And I'd like to just quickly uh, thank the Colangio Carcinoma Foundation for, um, for hosting this uh, ICRN and ENSCO webinar. Um, I'd like to just quickly, before Ethan starts off with his presentation, uh, to invite everybody to submit questions in the Q&A. Um, try and use the Q&A. Uh, you can also use the chat. Uh, I'll be keeping an eye on both of those. We're going to try and make this a little bit interactive and a bit more relaxed. So uh, I will, uh, at intervals, just uh, jump in. I hope Ethan doesn't mind me uh, just asking a few questions. Uh, and uh, I'll also be posing uh, your questions. Um, so uh, I think I'm going to learn a lot today. Uh, I didn't know supermassive intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma was was a thing. So I'm looking forward to it. Ethan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Valle. And uh, I echo your, your thanks to the Cholangiocarcinoma Foundation, to ICRN for the opportunity, um, to, to Donna, your team for organizing. And as I said uh, uh, before, before we started, I'm something of a, I'm, I'm rather starstruck right now being on the same uh, webinar as Dr. Valle. So this is very um, intimidating for me. Uh, all the same, I really appreciate the opportunity to present uh, show some of our findings, and also provide something of an overview of the role of radiotherapy in the treatment of intrahepatic angiocarcinoma. Um, so today I wanted to go through, my slides will advance nicely, hey, there it is, perfect. Uh, go through today uh, a number of different topics. Um, again, exactly as Dr. Vela said, we do want this to be very interactive. Please feel free to pose questions. Um, you know, today I wanted to spend some time going through radiotherapy, a primer, as many of the folks on this call may not be radiation oncologists uh, and have no direct exposure or, you know, regular contact with radiation oncology. I think demystifying some of these uh, terms is going to be very helpful and providing maybe a little bit of an overview about what we do and, and how we do it. In addition to that, I think the important to note are the key technological advances that have gotten us to where we are today in liver-directed radiation and how this has allowed us to use ablative high-dose radiation in the treatment of intrahepatic angiocarcinoma, which has become an increasingly commonly utilized technique by which we can consolidate and definitively treat uh, inoperable or unresectable uh, patients. Uh, from there, I think we're going to open up to supermassive as a concept and a term. It's a term something of our own design. We're rather astronomy nerds. All radiation oncologists are a little bit nerdy by nature. We're all physics geeks who are pretty kind of consciously left in the basement somewhere. Um, and so to that end, uh, supermassive as a concept, not just in terms of the size or volume of a tumor, but some of the unique challenges that come with treating tumors quite this large uh, are gonna be presented. And some um, data that we're showing for the first time that we're very excited by, suggesting that combination approaches of both systemic therapy and definitive local therapy with external radiation hold promise for patients, even as we enter the era of targeted therapy and with Topaz-1 immunotherapy. So a primer in radiation therapy itself, delivering radiation therapy with external beam techniques using a linear accelerator allows us to use ionizing radiation. Imagine you take a diagnostic X-ray, you turn up the energy of that photon by about a thousand fold, and the properties of those ionizing photons are such that they can damage 
the integrity of cells and their ability um, to survive and then undergo subsequent mitosis. Conventionally, ionizing radiation causes both direct and indirect damage to these cells. Most of the damage is indirect, such that ionizing radiation produces intracellularly free radicals and reactive oxygen species that then damage DNA and cause double-stranded breaks that are lethal. And about 30% of the damage from ionizing photons is directly against DNA uh, molecules themselves, uh, leading to double-strand breaks and subsequent cell death. There are properties and radiobiological advantages to doing external beam radiation, particularly fractionated radiation, which allows for preservation of normal tissues while capitalizing on the absence of repair pathways conventionally not seen in certain cancer cells. Without getting too far down the radio radiobiological rabbit hole, which everyone in radiation oncology has to take dedicated board exams to, let's get down to what actually happens when you send a patient for radiation. We treat using a machine known as a linear accelerator. And this machine, you can see here, a patient is on a treatment couch. And this machine, as you can see right here, rotates around the patient on a gantry. And at the head of the gantry is delivering beams of radiation. The way in which this happens is using a power generator. We accelerate electrons shot out of an electron gun over the course of about six feet here. We accelerate them to approaching the speed of light. We send them around this 270 degree bending magnet, think of a roller coaster, and then they strike a target typically made of tungsten, which converts the energy from these high energy electrons into high energy photons, which then pass through the head of the gantry and are fired at the patient. In the head of the gantry itself are multi-leaf collimators, these little lead fingers, which mold and shape the beam itself even as the gantry, this device rotates around the patient in totality, as you can see here, which allows for both exceedingly fast and highly conformal radiation to be delivered. These techniques are alternatively named many different things. IMRT, VMAT, we'll go through those, but the concept is the same. We're modulating a beam of radiation as we use different beam angles to our advantage. This is the modern linear accelerator. Um, as you can see here, a patient on the couch, and the gantry revolving around the patient with the head of the gantry shown here um, towards the patient's left. Now, this is important, all of these technological feats, because this is what radiation looked like on the order of uh, 60, 70 years ago. This is a patient in Stanford where Henry Kaplan first used linear accelerators to treat definitively Hodgkin lymphoma. And Hodgkin lymphoma represents one of the first diseases treated definitively, curatively, absent surgical resection using radiation. Now, what you can see here is this little boy is sitting on the table. There's a machine delivering radiation. And of course, this small child is not immobilized. Uh, there's no reasonable reliance of exactly what we're treating, where or when. Uh, and so you can see that technology has to have come a long way for us to deliver highly focused and reliable treatments to targets that are moving, that are subject to respiratory motion and subject to anatomic variation, depending on whether patients have uh, a more inflated or less inflated stomach, gas or constipation, excess bowels. There's all sorts of reasons that we need to be very precise when we treat the upper abdomen, particularly with high doses. Which gets us to what technology has allowed us to do over the last 15 years. Patients nowadays are immobilized in what you can see here is this dark blue vac lock or a vacuum locked cradle, which essentially is if you took a bean bag and then removed all the air out of it while you were sitting in it, it would make a mold of how you were sitting in it. So the same thing applies to patients who undergo a simulation or a planning scan for radiation. They, engage, they lie in one of these vacuum lock cradles, we remove all the air from it, and consequently we have a mold that is reproducible and reliable for each patient's physical anatomy. That allows us to reproducibly have the patient in the same physical position, position each day, but as you might imagine, when you treat in the upper abdomen, you also are subject to respiratory motion. The diaphragm's motion up and down, affords you some degree of uh, challenge in terms of reliably targeting and treating the liver. So to that end, a variety and a constellation of techniques have been um, cultivated by different groups. Uh, without getting too far in the weeds about the diversity of those techniques, one that we're partial to involves patients quite simply holding their breath. We use infrared reflectors and cameras that monitor where the patients are in the breathing cycle. And we actually have patients wear goggles at the time of simulation that show them where they are in their breathing cycle so that they can hit in a certain reliable range that level of breath hold. And so this allows us to reproducibly have the patient holding their breath the same each and every day.
But we take it a step further. While we can use biofeedback systems for respiratory management, and that affords us some level of certainty about what we're treating, what you really want to know on a day-to-day -day basis is that you're treating anatomically the same location each and every day. And this is really where image guidance has allowed all of these techniques and advances to come of age. We have used in, in our facility, and, and there are other variations on this theme, a technology called CT on rails, which quite simply means a patient lies down on a treatment couch you can see here in the center of the image. The linear accelerator is on the right-hand side and the CT on rails device on the left. And that means with each fraction of radiation, we do a diagnostic quality CAT scan, which reliably allows us to see the following and align with each and every fraction what the reference image is on the right, which is the simulation scan, and what the daily treatment image is on the left, which means if the duodenum is a little more full, what we can do is in real time adapt the radiation fields and shift them away from the duodenum. So more gas, less gas, a change in the liver position, or let's say that the patient develops biliary obstruction in the middle of your treatment, you're going to see that and you're gonna see the changes in liver anatomy. So it's allowed us both clinically and technically allowed to move the needle a good deal forward. The culmination of those technologies, putting all the pieces together has allowed us to deliver higher doses than we ever could have in the past because we can reliably treat tumors, because we can use technology, including those modulation of the uh, output from the gantry head using the multi-leaf collimator, we can now deliver exceptionally high doses to a tumor and spare the immediately adjacent organs at risk, which are very radiosensitive, particularly GI luminal structures like the uh, stomach and the duodenum. And so what we do is we treat as much as possible while respecting the constraints of say the stomach or the duodenum. So the technique is known as a simultaneous integrated boost an SIB with simultaneous integrated protection. And without getting too far in the weeds, that means that a left-sided tumor is harder for us to treat than a right-sided tumor. The more a tumor is adjacent to kissing, abutting, or potentially even invading a luminal structure like the stomach, presents an increased kind of scale of complexity of challenge for us in order to respect the constraints of luminal structures like stomach or duodenum. Commonly, in this situation, we use any variety of treatment regimens. And again, if you're talking to your, your, your friendly neighborhood radiation oncologist, they'll describe things in units of gray, which allows you to get a sense of the total dose delivered, but it's also important uh, to understand how long the treatment course is. A dose like 50 gray, as shown here, but delivered over only four fractions, over one week of treatment, means that the patient receives actually a very high equivalent dose biologically. And we use formulas that rely on radiobiological principles to convert a total dose and the duration of the treatment into a single common unit that we call the biologically effective or biological equivalent dose known as the BED. Commonly, we treat patients over three weeks, 15 fractions to 60 or 67.5 gray, or we go uh, over a much longer course of treatment over five weeks to 75 to 100 gray, or for these one week or fewer treatments, we go to 50 gray, which is commonly done for very small tumors. For these one week or fewer treatments, the technical term for them is actually SBRT, a term that you'll hear very often from your local radiation oncologist. It simply refers to high dose radiation delivered over one week or less. So putting the pieces together for this primer, we see that advanced technologies, including respiratory management, onboard daily imaging, they allow us to deliver high reliable, highly conformal radiotherapy while respecting day-to-day -day changes in anatomy and, and, and position of critical organs at risk. Also noteworthy, and we'll get through this a little later, is the advent of functional imaging and quantitative imaging to personalize therapy and further allow us to refine our radiation treatment plans respecting where functional hepatic parenchyma is, particularly in patients who have limited residual normal parenchyma. Turning again to nomenclature for a moment, all of these that we've talked about so far are photon-based techniques. Uh, I'll actually pause for a moment. I just want to make sure, Dr. Valet, any, um, uh, this is a good breaking point perhaps? Thank, thank you very much, Ethan, and a really great introduction. Um, I, I think, you quite rightly highlight that technology has evolved, the ability to deliver more targeted radiotherapy has evolved, the techniques have improved over time. So, so it's really two questions that I have at, at this point. 
I sometimes feel that whenever we're looking at the results of clinical trial data, we seem to always be starting all over again. You know, those are the results, but that's that technology, that was an old hat, we now can do this, and so those results don't matter. So one of the, the, the challenges and the question to you is, at what point are we comfortable that, that we can interpret the data from studies in the past? And the second question is really, if, if a patient is treated at your institution, what, what is the, the likelihood that the treatment they will receive at a different institution will deliver the same type of treatment? What's the standardization of, of treatment? Uh, as a medical oncologist, it's very much about systemic treatments, so, um, but, but with radiation, how is that achieved? Those are phenomenal questions. Um, and, and part of my job is, is sort of separate in the statistics department where uh, we spend a lot of time looking at tr clinical trial design and execution. Um, and, and this is one of the great challenges of trials on local therapies that are experiencing in real time advances in technology. Because how do you interpret a trial, even in an intra trial period, even from the time you open a study to the time you close the study, advents and advances in technology. And it's also noteworthy that these advances in technology are not uniform. The entire community isn't going in one direction all at once. We believe that CT on rails might be great, and our colleagues at, at, at uh, WashU and St. Louis might feel that an MRI-based uh, linear accelerator, that that's the future. And so the questions of not just a single direction forward and momentum of, clinical, of, technology, of technological advances, but also this sort of pell-mell approach to everyone scattering off to different directions makes standardization incredibly challenging. And it also speaks to the challenges of running multi-institutional trials in the setting. In the pancreas space, for instance, an attempt to run a, random, a, a randomized study, a phase two study, looking at SBRT preoperatively, um, you know, the results we were presented in abstract form and we're waiting for the publication. But one of the primary drivers of some of these concerns was lack of standardization in QA. A paper that we published about three months ago um, uh, demonstrated that there are exceedingly poor mechanisms of standardization for local therapy trials, particularly as regards radiotherapy and IR-based approaches, and that this might in fact correlate with an absence of signal seen in trials. That said, the cynic in me says, well, of course you say that about your own modality. You're just trying to say, ah, that was before, now we're going to get it, right? It's kind of like Charlie Brown kicking the football, right? Mm -hmm. Eventually, you kind of ask the question, is it just that it doesn't quite work the way you think it does? And this presents some challenges. And I think even skeptics about the evidence, you know, there's, you, you kind of see, like everything in life, there's, there's that gray zone of understanding. There's probably some efficacy here, but you have to be careful about who you select. And then to your other question regarding multi-institutional kind of comparisons, this speaks to, I think, some extent, volume and experience. And there are some data out there that support the notion that with increased volume of treating the upper abdomen to dose-escalated fractionation, you probably are going to correlate that with some, to some degree with safety. That said, there isn't one way to skin the cat here. So again, you know, different technologies. And, you know, the, the, the short answer to the question is no, there isn't really a good way to say, does my local radiation oncology practice have enough experience that I, as a medical oncologist, feel, feel good referring um, to them? There isn't a great answer to that. It's kind of the unfortunate truth there. Um, but that's, that's just my perspective. Thank you, Ethan. And there's one quick, quick question that's come in on the, the chat. Uh, when you talk about protecting abutting structures, how does having tumors close to large blood vessels and bile ducts affect, affect decision making? That's a phenomenal question. And I thank Dr. McAllister for that. So it's interesting. The radiosensitivity of different structures is something that we've studied in our community for now getting on over a century. So we know that blood vessels, especially venous structures, which are low pressure systems, are quite radio resistant. So often it takes two or even three rounds of radiation before you get to a sufficient risk of, say, arterial blowout or um, uh, vascular compromise. Uh, similarly, with, biliary tract, uh, with the biliary tract itself, we know that there are radiobiological constraints on the bile duct itself. And even at the maximal doses that I showed you in those dose fractionation schemes, we're still below the tolerance of the common bile duct. So secondary radiation-induced biliary stricture which is more common than any vascular complication of radiation, is still itself a relatively uncommon phenomenon on the order of 5% or less. The one subpopulation I'll note that's a little bit challenging are patients who have underlying PSCs. Those patients tend to be very, very challenging to get through radiotherapy. Thank you. And just before we let you move on, what's the difference between saying SBRT and hypofractionated RT came in the chat? Wonderful. And I thank Dr. Spencer for that question. 
essentially without I, I, and if there are other radiation oncologists on the call I'm, I'm, I'm very open to others or perspective SPRT is defined as lasting one week or fewer hypofractionated typically refers to courses on the order of three weeks long so at the end of the day it's one versus three weeks the technologies used for both of those things tend to be one and the same thank you I'll um, let you carry on and I guess take it Absolutely. And, and that actually speaks to this slide here, which is why would you choose one thing over the other? And typically for larger tumors or tumors with close proximity to luminal structures, a more fractionated course, which is to say a longer duration, tends to afford more protection and lead less risk of complication, toxicity or ulceration than those shorter courses. So you'll see folks like our institution typically favor the three week hypofractionated approach for bigger tumors, left-sided tumors, tumors close to luminal structures, than small tumors, say, sitting in the very center of hepatic parenchyma, where you can really get away with SBRT without breaking a sweat. Um, all of these terms, IMRT, VMAT, which is essentially uh, the next iteration of IMRT and SBRT, all use the same technologies I described so far. They're all photon-based, which is to say ionizing radiation. Um, the alternative, and something that I think has become, especially in the States, particularly commercialized, is the use of particle-based therapy, primarily proton beam therapy, which, again, removing the commercial interest is, for all intents and purposes, simply another tool in the toolbox. And I think that's a helpful way to conceptualize it, both from our side as radiation oncologists and from medical oncology standpoint as well. Why does this matter? Why do protons matter at all? Well, there we go. Uh, here's why. When a photon enters a body, when you deliver with a linear accelerator, the photon passes all the way through the human and strikes the other wall opposite the linear accelerator, which is why when your institutions build a vault for a linear accelerator, there's four feet thick of concrete on any given side of the linear accelerator, because once the photon passes through a patient, we have to degrade it with concrete or similar so that it doesn't go into the next room. Um, protons have a relatively unique property. Think of them as depth charges. At a specific energy, a proton will enter tissue, deposit the vast majority of its dose at a pre-specified depth, which corresponds to its energy, and then have no further exit dose. That peak, that point of the depth charge is known as the Bragg peak. And it affords you an impressive potential to spare critical structures nearby. And that's important. Protons are not thought to improve disease control or kill cancer better. Rather, they're thought to improve upon the ability to spare tissues nearby. So I'll show you two comparison points, right? So here are two tumors, uh, a proton treated uh, tumor on the, on the uh, left and an IMRT treated tumor on the right. The um, differences in size and position of the tumor notwithstanding, I draw your attention to the blue lines, to sort of those blue purplish lines. And what you can see is there's sort of a cloud of those doses outside of where the tumor is here on the IMRT plan and really a steep dose fall off on the proton plan where essentially the whole left liver is not getting any radiation dose. This matters for, we think, a few reasons, primarily in the context of HCC or patients with underlying liver dysfunction, um, excuse me, or cirrhosis. So we uh, believe that by sparing low dose radiation to uninvolved parenchyma, you may in fact be better preserving liver function in the unirradiated uh, tumor, in the unirradiated liver. So much so that in the United States, we have a large scale cooperative phase three trial examining this very question of proton versus photon radiation for patients with uh, HCC. And the basis for this are uh, several kind of large series and including prospective studies demonstrating that with uh, photon based radiation, we see a 30% rate of clinically significant worsening of liver dysfunction, of liver function after uh, photon based radiation. But by comparison, only a 4% rate of, of, of liver decompensation after proton beam therapy. And so again, we don't think that protons are more likely to kill off tumor, but perhaps in the right context, they might do a better job of preserving uninvolved hepatic parenchyma. And we've seen this in several retrospective series. Here's a nice one from Mass General demonstrating that local failure between protons and photons is similar, but overall survival's improved. So quite ambitiously, the trialists for this study um, have set the primary endpoint as overall survival, uh, and it's a superior design trial. So they're trying to get very ambitious about the potential benefit of proton beam therapy in this context. Um, all that said, I think 
rather than turning more into the space of HCC, the question is when do we use protons in practice in our center and several others? And it depends very much on individualized decision-making. What is the anatomy of the patient? What's the anatomy of the tumor? Do we believe that the patient has sufficiently limited absolute volume of functional hepatic parenchyma that we need to use proton beam therapy? And I think that's where we are in proton beam therapy in 2022. It's also noteworthy that as much as protons have in some, some ways been commercialized, the technology is still quite young. And so the ability to successfully do image guidance the ability to reliably treat tumors, we believe is quite good, and the data certainly suggests is quite good, but we don't have quite the same uh, decades-long experience as we do with linear accelerators and photons. I wonder if I can just quickly jump in here, Ethan, with, with a question. Um, the thing about proton beam therapy is that it self-markets itself, um, and patients have heard about it, patients come asking about it, um, and so... Uh, what, what are your thoughts about the willingness of patients to be randomized within a study? Um, and do you think there's equipoise amongst uh, clinicians? It's a phenomenal question. And so we actually have three large scale proton versus photon trials here in the States for HCC as shown here for esophageal cancer and for oropharynx cancer. All of them I would submit have very thoughtfully designed primary endpoints looking at uh, toxicity mitigation, toxicity burden, rates of feeding tube placement. I think they're, they're rather thoughtful trials and we'll see a few of them are coming to fruition hopefully in the near term. Um, with regard to equipoise, uh, you know, there, there are certainly commercial interests at stake. Um, for those of us in the ivory tower, um, we try our very best to remove ourselves from that and, and, and we do believe there is clinical equipoise. Um, you know, until, you know, even with retrospective data, we all know, right, this is, this is a question that is best answered uh, with a prospective randomized study. And quite remarkably, we've seen successful enrollment and randomization on these studies across these disease sites, suggesting that this is feasible even in the United States. And I say even in because this is a, you know, this is a, a, a country where the commercialization of certain aspects of our healthcare have compromised some of our ability to run certain types of randomized studies if I might be a little inflammatory there. Yeah, so, so we're hoping to join the uh, GI003 study uh, here in the UK. There's a question from Dr. Spencer on the, on the Q&A. Is cost the only limitation to giving everybody proton? It's a phenomenal question. Um, my own clinical practice, and this is because I'm, I'm something of, um, of a purist, is, is I sort of look at, I try to look at the anatomy, the liver function, all of that. We sometimes get functional liver imaging with a spec scan. And then I sort of make a determination of, do we think that photon-based techniques will spare a sufficient amount of hepatic parenchyma that we don't need to talk about protons? And for the vast majority of patients, for about 60, 70% of my patients, I don't ever need to go down the proton rabbit hole. But for the handful where it seems clinically and anatomically it's the right move, then we open up that kind of, that, 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 that door. And there are instances where despite it being, in my opinion, a superior therapy um, based on the individual factors, uh, we've, we've seen insurance uh, companies and payers not willing to subsidize the cost of, of protons. And so we've had to use what we think is still a good, but perhaps not as good a plan with photons. Thank you. And finally, do you, do you think there may be an advantage in allowing a little bit of a radiation halo because of you know, movement? And I know you try to minimize as much. So, so conversely, could there be a disadvantage of being so targeted that you might miss around the edges? A phenomenal question. And this is one that our community has sort of grappled with and had existential anxiety about since IMRT first came into being now over 20 years ago, where the thought was, if you get sufficiently conformal, have you now gotten to the point where you're potentially gonna have an increased risk of what we call marginal misses? And that's data that across every disease site, we've tried to be very vigilant about exploring. And to date, we haven't seen evidence of that. There are certain types and patterns of, of radiologic spread of these biliary tract cancers that make that, that, that give me and, and some of my colleagues a little anxiety. Some tumors that we all have seen where there's an extensive infiltrative tentacle-like spread in biliary radicals that extends, you can see it almost up the whole biliary tree. And you sort of say to yourself, I can't treat the entire thing with radiation. I know that. I can't cover this whole thing without absolutely compromising liver function. Those cases, I think we sort of accept an increased risk of marginal miss, but in general, we try and watch for that. And in any radiation-based patterns of failure study, um, we should be looking at where disease relapse occurs relative to the radiation field. Thank you, and um, please carry on. Absolutely. So 
putting the pieces together, I think this is a really helpful discussion. Radiation itself is a non-invasive modality. It doesn't rely on specific vascularization. It doesn't rely on vascular supply of tumors. We can treat tumor thrombi. We can treat large tumors. We'll, we'll follow that in a moment. And of course, we can treat multiple tumors. So there are advantages to external beam radiation. And it's a, it's, a, it's a misconception that there's some degree of clashing between us and interventional radiology who favors radioembolization with Y90 or the institutions and, and centers that really favor hepatic artery infusion. There, there are a lot of studies, including ones that we're, 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 we're pursuing here, looking at combination local modalities where that seems to be an advantageous approach. And so these are simply some of the reasons that external beam has particular advantages, perhaps over some of the other local therapies. And this is something that can be helpful, especially in combination approaches. So with all of these advantages, with all of these new technologies, what's become of it? And a seminal paper from our institution in 2016 reported on a threshold biological dose of 80.5, above which we saw high rates of local control and improved overall survival for patients. While a small series, this was subsequently validated by two other centers, and it says essentially, from where I'm standing, that ablative radiation can confer both improved local control and survival in well-selected intrahepatic angio patients who are unresectable. An additional study using registry-based data has suggested that with improved time and improved technologies, we sort of see a shift in improved outcomes, which all speaks to that common outcome, that common denominator of perhaps absent randomized control trial data, perhaps with the advent of technologies, we're moving the needle in the right direction. This was further confirmed with proton beam therapy, a multi-institutional study that was headed up by our colleagues at Mass General that we participated in, used proton beam therapy for these malignancies as well, and demonstrated that for intrahepatic cholangio patients treated with ablative doses of radiation, two-year local control rates were exceptionally high above 90%, and about half of the patients were alive at two years. So that's all well and good, but the skeptic would ask, why does that matter? And how does that matter? Particularly in patients who have satellitosis or known metastatic disease. And the answer to my mind comes down to a patterns of failure and cause of death analysis. So a cause of death analysis from MD Anderson, looking at 400 patients published in 2017, demonstrated that what we conceptually call tumor-related liver failure which is to say death related to liver failure, a function of vascular or biliary complications because of the tumor itself, was the cause of death or approximate cause of death in a majority of patients, in 72% of patients, which essentially led us to a sort of conceptual framework that we all operate on, which is that if you control the tumor locally, you decrease risk of tumor-related liver failure and you improve overall survival. You may not cure or treat every single cancer cell in the body, but because this appears to be a sufficiently uh, impressive risk factor for being a proximate cause of death for patients, we believe that this relationship is what drives the reason that consolidating patients with local therapy appears to matter. Turning for a moment that who actually is eligible for radiation before we dive farther in, it's important to note that while radiation has many advantages, we are selected to some extent. Patients who have poor baseline liver function, child Pew scores B8 or higher, patients with history of variceal bleeding or ascites, these are patients that we still can treat, but we're a little more cautious about it. Patients with poor performance status, limited residual or functional hepatic parenchyma left, prior liver-directed therapies, prior radiation, prior Y90, this you know, suddenly turns into a re-irradiation setting, and that also complicates our considerations. And lastly, as I alluded to before, there are certain underlying medical conditions that can complicate our ability to do radiation, particularly PSC and ulcerative colitis. Autoimmune-based diseases themselves, and as a rule, don't go along super well with radiation. We know that radiation can exacerbate any active autoimmune condition underlying for everything from scleroderma to ulcerative colitis and PSC. And so those patients we still will treat on occasion, but we tend to be very aggressive about supportive measures for them and also fractionate their courses more. We're more willing to go gently and treat them over five weeks rather than consolidate everything in one or three weeks. And of course, it's important to note radiation is not without risk. In addition to harming luminal structures like stomach or bowel and causing ulceration or bleeding, radiation-induced liver damage remains one of the primary reasons that ablative radiation is now possible but wasn't before. We were not able to spare enough hepatic parenchyma using older technologies. Radiation-induced liver damage itself tends to come in two flavors, classic and non-classic. Classic RILD typically is a function of overdosing hepatic parenchyma, and typically you see veno-occlusive disease, anecteric hepatomegaly, 
Um, and it can lead to a fulminant liver decompensation and failure and be a proximate cause of death for patients. Notably, in the setting of the modern era with ablative doses and modern treatment planning, modern as it is today, not as it will be in 10 years, but we've seen a marked decrease in risk of classic RILD. So much so that my colleagues and I, we haven't seen a case of classic RILD now for several years, despite having a relatively large volume of hepatobiliary patients. Just a very quick question, Ethan. We're very good at measuring tests of liver dysfunction, you know, the prolonged clotting, abnormal uh, liver function tests. Uh, what are your thoughts about using tests of liver function in designing green or some other assessment of how the liver is actually working and, and factoring that in? A phenomenal question and something that I think is certainly worth further exploration. We've pivoted that to some extent and tried to go down that road both in the sort of pre-radiation setting and now increasingly trying in the post-radiation setting to use uh, functional liver imaging to try and give us a sense of where and how much volumetrically hepatic, functional hepatic parenchyma is as a sort of benchmark of not only helping us do radiation treatment planning, but give us a better sense of what those sort of low dose clouds with photon based radiation are doing to that hepatic parenchyma, even absent underlying cirrhosis as you would see in many cholangial patients. So I appreciate the question, and I think it's certainly an area of active exploration. My colleague, Eugene Coy, has been leading the charge on that now for several years with prospective studies. So we're excited to report those out, hopefully in the coming year. Thank you. Absolutely. No, thank you. So we've seen, and I think this has been a good introduction of where we are and how we get to where we are today. But one of the things we're noticing, of course, is that while we're sort of probing the edges of what we can do technologically, we want to see exactly how far that edge can go in the modern era. So while we see benefits of local therapy, the question is, are there other substances of patients who we historically have sort of shied away from treating that we might be more willing to treat with the uh, hope and the hypothesis of improving uh, their outcomes? Uh, we're going to spend time today talking about patients with supermassive tumors, but there are other settings as well that we'll get into towards the end. Um, patients with M1 disease, with no metastatic disease, patients with impaired liver function and beyond. So let's get to supermassive, right? A term that we borrowed from the astronomy community as they describe supermassive black holes, because we've all seen these tumors. And if you look at the NCDB registry data, about a quarter of patients with intrahepatic cholangia will have tumors greater than 10 centimeters in size. Similarly, if you look at institutional data, tumors greater with, G with gross tumor volumes on the order of a liter or more uh, account for about 20% of intrahepatic cholangia patients. These are really large tumors. And the size itself, presents many challenges with regard to local therapy. Not only do we think that these patients are at exceptionally high risk for tumor-related liver failure because they are extensive and often involved with multiple aspects of the vasculature, but these tumors are often supplied by numerous different intra and extrahepatic blood supplies, make it very challenging to deliver arterial-based therapies for some of our colleagues who deliver alternative local modalities. And of course, these are very challenging tumors surgically as well. Um, so putting the pieces together, it presents an opportunity to use a modality where it is non-invasive and we are not dependent on blood supply per se. So enter radiation oncology. So it's noteworthy that as we describe this, all of the prior series and data that I've described to you using radiation in the setting, essentially no patients in those studies had tumors with an absolute tumor dimension greater than 10 centimeters. The tumors on average were five to six centimeters uh, uh, in length. And the gross tumor volume was on the order of 100 to 200 cc's. These tumors, as I'm about to show you, are on the you know are usually an order of magnitude bigger than that. So we're seeing some of the more impressive and large tumors. Here's a nice example of a patient who had a very impressive left-sided tumor with satellitosis, and we consolidated him with with um, you know after just six months of gemcitabine cisplatin with uh, external beam radiation, and the patient remains NED now off systemic therapy 12 months later. Um, without, uh, you know, without uh, maintenance systemic therapy. Um, so it's these sorts of individual and anecdotal cases that certainly give us some guidance and some hope that this modality might be helpful for patients with some of the largest and most challenging tumors. So we wanted to characterize the safety of efficacy and the efficacy of using radiation in the setting. We wanted to look at the incidence of tumor-related liver failure as well as radiation-related toxicities. And we wanted to look at the unique molecular profiles because speaking to this audience in particular, are patients with particularly massive tumors, patients who have disproportionately differential molecular profiles? Are these patients more likely to have FGFR2 alterations? Are they more likely to have IDH mutations? And so we wanted to explore all of those aspects to treating patients in this, in this setting. 
So we looked at our own institutional experience and we had 63 patients over the last uh, 10 years who've had tumors this large. Um, about half were treated with radiotherapy and half were not. Uh, the primary reason that the handful who were, you know, that the half who were not treated with radiation weren't treated with radiation is typically because they came to us for a second opinion. We potentially recommended radiation, but then they returned to their home centers for care, which did not include RT. So it's an interesting uh, cohort, and all the itinerant limitations will be, of course, reviewed as, as all things retrospective are. But we can see that the cohorts are generally very well balanced. In addition to that, for the patients who received radiotherapy, um, the vast majority received GEMSYS uh, for six months in the lead up to radiation, and the median time from uh, the chemotherapy to radiation was six months. So it's a typical pattern that we've, that we've done for patients. It's noteworthy that our institutional practice has also been to typically treat patients with concurrent Cape Cytobine during the radiation course as a radiosensitizer, extrapolating off of a number of other sites where Cape Cytobine is routinely used to that extent. Um, these patients were essentially uniformly treated with 15 fractions of radiation, treated to ablative doses above that threshold BED that we described before, and 70% were treated with photon-based techniques, 30 with proton-based techniques. The median GTV, the median gross tumor size, was on the order of 700 cc's, and notably, five patients in the, of the 31 who got radiation subsequently underwent liver transplantation or surgery. So we think of that as a potential, you know, in the context of bridging therapies, which others in, in other disease sites and, and in other contexts with Y90 and hepatic artery infusion have discussed as well. So getting down to the data, we see a marked improvement in overall survival between the patients treated with RT versus chemo alone, uh, median survival of uh, 29 months versus 12 months. Similarly, if you conduct a landmark analysis to try and account for a mortal time bias, that difference is preserved. Um, and we also separated these patients out based on metastatic status, and we see a continued separation of curves irrespective of whether patients at the time of diagnosis had metastatic disease. We further looked at cause of death for patients and found that tumor-related liver failure was markedly more likely to occur among the patients who did not get radiation. 50% of those patients died of tumor-related liver failure, whereas only 12% of radiation patients did die of tumor-related liver failure. So that speaks generally to the overall context of improving overall survival by virtue of decreasing risk of tumor-related liver failure. That's all well and good, but how was radiation tolerated? The answer is overall fairly well, with relatively few grade two toxicities and only two grade three late toxicities of two patients who developed post-radiation GI bleeding, where aggressive supportive measures and blood transfusions were, uh, uh, were utilized and the patients had spontaneous resolution of bleeding within several weeks without endoscopic intervention. And this is unfortunately a relatively uh, common side effect. I typically quote patients between five and 10% of the time this will happen. Um, and that's often in the context of patients who have under, you know, who are either on anticoagulation uh, or have underlying risk of variceal bleeding um, uh, or have underlying gastritis. So these are patients for whom we try to get pretty aggressive and sometimes prophylax against GI bleeding. Turning to the mutational and molecular analysis, over 90% of the patients in our institutional cohort um, were uh, analyzed using Foundation One uh, uh, analysis. And so we have molecular mutational data and alteration data for over 90% of the patients. And what we saw here is that across the board of common mutations and alterations, there was no significant difference between patients who did and then a large, you know, multi, you know, several hundred institutional pa patient cohort of patients who did not have supermassive tumors um, as well. So we see here common and, and, and similar rates of IDH mutation, maybe a slightly smaller population who had TP353, TP53 mutations, but in general, similarities between the two cohorts. So we don't see any enriched subsets of, of, of patients from a molecular side uh, between these cohorts, admittedly with all the itinerant limitations of a small series and a retrospective study. Similarly, just quickly, yeah. patients sorry, who... sorry to jump in. Quick, quickly, just out yeah, of interest no, on, on your last slide. Um, do the patients with a, with a BRCA2 mutation and, and the radiation, do they, they do particularly well? Um... A phenomenal question, a phenomenal question. 
uh, in that we think, of course, that for BRCA alteration, that perhaps there's an increased both platinum sensitivity and perhaps mm -hmm. an increased radio sensitivity, which would speak to first principles. The reality is, no, we haven't seen that. And very interestingly, a lot of the data from other disease sites that have common, more common BRCA mutations, everything from breast to pancreas, you name it, we've never actually seen a clinically strong signal that they're more radio sensitive, as best I can tell. I'm very open to being wrong on that. And hopefully we are finding patients with, a, with, with um, subsets of increased radio sensitivity. We do think perhaps that the FGFR2 altered patients might be a little more, uh, have more durable local control. And I'll present some of those data, which we published last year as well. Um, but, but in general, we don't see quite such striking signals for radio sensitivity by mutational profile. It's a great question. Um, that was that was what we were getting at with BRCA, right? Okay. Um, so then, and then, in terms of comparing patients who didn't didn't get RT, very similar across the cohorts. A slight enrichment of patients who had IDH alteration for the uh, those who did receive radiation. And notably, we tend to find that IDH mutant patients uh, typically carry a worse prognosis. So the fact that we continue to see um, a signal there for radiation, uh, in my mind, is is certainly noteworthy. Um, being, being sort of a part-time statistician, I'm, I'm a believer in multivariable models can, can tell you whatever your heart desires and they can be made to look however you, you like them to be. Um, and that's, that's perhaps blasphemous, but, but I'll, 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 I'll recant if I have to. Um, but I ran a, a slew of different multivariable models trying to see whether there's any um, ways we could uh, remove the signal for radiation, whether it's possibly being confounded by some other aspects of, of these patients, whether they have satellitosis, whether there's a specific mutational signature. And rather than going through each of these iterations of molecular, uh, of, of multivariable analysis, we tend to see a preserved hazard ratio on the dot of 0.4 for um, uh, the receipt of radiation, which is significant across every multivariable model we ran. That includes uh, integration of multiple molecular characteristics of patients. That includes just looking at their clinical features. That includes clinical and genomic features integrated in single models. So however you cut the cake for this small series, we certainly seem to see that radiation makes a difference in terms of survival. Um, we're also exploring, as we were alluding to, differential roles of, of, of specific mutational signatures by, based on um, receipt of radiation, and we're seeing kind of where those frontiers are as well. We tend to see that the IDH wild-type patients do, of course, better than the IDH mutant patients, the, big th the big 3 ca mutation patients doing worse than the wild-type patients there. Um, and in the interest of time, I'll get us to um, the last component of these data, which is that we tried to look at our own series as compared with a national standard. So we then turned to the NCDB, which is in the United States uh, registry that accounts for 72% of all cancer cases in the States. And we looked at patients with intrahepatic cholangio treated from 2011 on again in the GEMSYS era who had tumors greater than 10 centimeters and didn't have any local therapy. And for these 800 patients, again, comparing to our series, we see significant benefits in overall survival that are preserved even if you do a six month landmark analysis and we took that a step further and then did frequency and propensity matching of patients by age, stage, tumor size, nodal and metastatic stage. And again, we see a significant improvement in survival. So putting the pieces together, in a retrospective series, a blade of radiation appears to be both safe and effective in improving survival among supermassive cholangio patients. We believe this may be explained by reducing the risk of tumor-related liver failure, which speaks to the hypothesis we were discussing earlier. There doesn't appear to be a distinct molecular profile of supermassive patients, and the receipt of radiation appears to potentially benefit patients irrespective of what their mutational profile carries. Of course, as with all retrospective series, there are itinerant limitations. There's tremendous selection bias that may not have been able to be measured even with all the efforts to control for them. It's a small sample size of a relatively uncommon setting, and of course, in the Topaz 1 era now, the question is whether GEM-CIS represents what we should be you know, doing concurrently with radiotherapy now, or concurrent Dervalumab is where we should be going with gem -CIS as well. Uh, and of course, speaking to your point earlier, Dr. Vallet, a single institution experience with a local therapy calls into question generalizability to other centers. And of course, need for prospective validation is important and something that we increasingly are trying to work on in our community and many others that focus on local therapies trying to ensure that we have prospective multi-institutional validation of data, because only through those methods are we going to see this advance just beyond idiosyncrasies and in how individual centers practice. 
the frontier now looks to M1 disease. Even in the setting of M1 disease, might the receipt of local therapy improve survival? Here's data from registry-based studies uh, back in uh, 2019, and our own institutional experience suggests that this is indeed validated, and our data are going to be presented hopefully in the coming six to, to, to eight months. And as we were alluding to before, we're trying to advance the frontier with functional imaging to map physiologic liver reserve both pre and post RT, and that'll help us particularly among the highest risk patients who have advanced cirrhosis, who've had prior radiation therapies with Y90 or external beam, and have had prior liver injury with extensive hepatotoxic therapy, patients with history, you know, fatty liver disease are now developing portal hypertension after a lot of chemotherapy. So with that, a lot of future directions here. We want to expand the role of local therapy and see if it can help patients across a variety of settings. We want to see if combination local approaches and local plus systemic therapy approaches are going to help get us to a better place for our intrahepatic cholangio patients. We've seen uh, several years ago now published two prospective phase two studies, one of Y90 plus GEMSYS, one of hepatic artery infusion plus GEMOX, and those show median overall survivals that are themselves very reassuring at 22 and 25 months, although of course work still needs to be done. And so integrating and understanding those local modalities and collaborating with one another is essential. We are not competitors in this setting. It's important for us to find the optimal solutions for us to see which patients benefit from which modality in which context. It's also noteworthy that in the era of both targeted therapy and immunotherapy, prospective studies combining RT with these are underway. Studies looking at dervalumab and trimalimumab plus RT are being done in a prospective single-arm phase two trial. Nevo RT plus or minus IPI is being done in a randomized phase two study as well. And of course, using RT for bridging or downstaging therapies pre-surgery or transplantation are underway as well. So all of these collectively suggest a bright and promising future where radiation is well integrated as in this array of modalities available to the cholangio patients. Um, I cannot thank enough the phenomenal team here at MD Anderson, my collaborators, colleagues, and friends. Um, the, one of the joys of working here is not only such wonderful and brilliant colleagues, but folks who are so willing to collaborate and talk and think about ways to put together a collaborative rather than a competitive environment. And it's a true joy. Um, I, I want to give a special thanks to Joey Abe Jauda, who's about to leave us to go join the Stanford Radiation Oncology Department, a, a, a real rock star in his own right. Um, who uh, with me uh, has put these data uh, together. And of course, thanks to our funding sources. Thank you very much, Ethan. Um, just have a, a couple more questions uh, to, to follow up on a uh, fantastic presentation of, of your, your local data. Um, so, so now that you know what you know, uh, there's really a question about selection. A selection of therapy and selection of patients. So when you're assessing a patient for radiation, what is your decision making between uh, radiotherapy and, and uh, radioembolization? How do, you, how do those patients look different? A phenomenal question. Um, my only wish was that uh, one of my IR colleagues would be here with me as well, that we could answer them in tandem. But broadly speaking, um, for non-metastatic patients, we tend to favor external beam radiation for patients with more central tumors, as this tends to be an optimal setting for delivery of external beam, often because the vascularization of those tumors is, you know, typically there are multiple sources of vascularization, and it's more challenging to deliver our, uh, arterial-based therapies for them. Um, one thing that I do think is worth noting in terms of the comparisons between radioembolization and external beam is that radioembolization um, to date has had some limitations with regard to dosimetric analysis such that our IR colleagues haven't always been able to reliably identify how much dose is being delivered when and where, which for us who are very much the nerds of physics in the basement, it gives us a lot of palpitations. So one of the things that I think is really phenomenal is that a prospective study being done here at MD Anderson, which is a multi-institutional study, has been looking at dosimetric evaluation of Y90 delivery, led by Armin Mavash here. And so that sort of effort, trying to ensure that Y90 is more standardized and we have a better sense of what dose is going where, are going to be very helpful in sort of better selecting patients and better identifying patients who are going to differentially benefit from one modality or the other. Yeah, I agree. And, and we really need to, to see some of that uh, data emerging. And then just pivoting to patient selection. Um, you know, there's obviously patients who have liver-only disease, 
Um, and then it depends on how hard you look. Do you do an FTG PET scan? Do you even think about doing a laparoscopy? Probably not necessary, but you know, it really how intensively do you, do you search? Do you allow patients with liver only and low volume extrahepatic disease or heavy burden extrahepatic disease? How might you incorporate that into a clinical trial? A phenomenal question and exceptionally hard to answer. I think one of the starting points, and we've tried to draft this protocol and it's still a work in progress, has been identifying where are those, you know, what defines extrahepatic disease where we think the risk of extrahepatic disease outweighs any potential local benefit to consolidating the primary, even in the M1 setting. So there are patients with satellitosis where we can safely encompass everything or a combination approach of external beam plus Y90 will safely eradicate with a total liver consolidation approach, right, to, to coin a term. Or patients with low volume and generally indolent lung metastases. We've all kind of seen that profile among some patients before as well, where the lung disease is, you know, peripheral and it's indolent and it's clearly not going to be a proximate cause of symptoms or morbidity mortality. The group that we tend to get a little more concerned about, exactly to your point about staging laparoscopy, and we tend to be a little bit liberal about diagnostic laparoscopy, are patients with carcinomatosis. Those mm -hmm. patients do have what we think is a pretty significant competing risk of death related to progression of carcinomatosis. Um, and so those patients, and, and, and what data that I did not show here is those patients may be the subset who do not seem to benefit from consolidating the primary. There's a subset who have low vol small volume peritoneal disease who are exceptional responders to chemo. Sometimes they're on targeted therapies with, you know, they've got an FGFR2 fusion and they're on pemigatinib and their disease is generally very well controlled. And so those patients might be the right subset to go after. But to your question, it's the carcinomatosis patients that give me, that, that give me, um, that give me second thoughts. Okay, uh, thank you. And just before I hand over back to, to Donna to, to close the session, um, uh, I have one final question. Uh, very often when we have meetings where patients uh, are, are present at, so the Glandular Carcinoma Foundation meeting and AMMF, um, usually uh, there is somebody in the audience who says, I don't have an intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. carcinoma. Um, so I, I know that we've been focusing specifically on supermassive HCCA, um, but how much of this is applicable to, say, a large cancers involving the gallbladder or, or the distal bile ducts? A phenomenal question and data that we hope to get out also in the coming several months. Hyler cases conceptually, <laughs> while they're clearly distinct biologically and they're you know, anatomic distinctions as well, Hyler cases tend to have the same anatomic features in that if they grow, tumor-related liver failure can easily be a proximate cause of death. And so for all intents and purposes, while they weren't included in the data you've seen here today, we do treat those cases rather similarly. Gallbladder, a little more challenging, often because gallbladder adenocarcinoma has such a propensity for distant metastases, particularly carcinomatosis. We have on occasion consolidated primary tumors of the gallbladder. We had this discussion yesterday in a research meeting um, uh, where the tumor is perhaps not, you know, closer to the hilum than not, and perhaps uh, extending in such a way that we believe um, you know, endoscopically and radiographically that the risk of tumor-related liver failure is not insignificant. Um, but even in those settings, the one sort of clinical judgment call that we tend to make is we try and integrate local therapy as seamlessly as possible. So often we'll do it just at the moment of the end of a cycle of gem cysts or GAP. We deliver local therapy in an abbreviated course, one or two weeks as, as safely as possible, and immediately get patients back to systemic therapy, given that the risk seems to be uh, really, a, the distant metastases, that that's the driving risk for gallbladder. Thank you very much, Ethan. Really appreciate a fantastic presentation and for your patience with me as a medical oncologist asking sometimes naive questions. Uh, Donna, uh, I'd like to hand over to you to close the session. Okay, thank you both, uh, Dr. Ludmer and Dr. Valle, uh, for your fantastic presentation today. It's very interactive and uh, of great interest to the audience. Um, we also appreciate everyone who joined us today and want to let you know that um, these, this presentation and all of the seminar series presentations will be available uh, online on our YouTube channel and also on the CCF website. Have a good day. Thanks. Bye-bye.